Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're looking at an interesting wilderness survival tool. This is a modern incarnation of the classic flint and steel for fire lighting. Now, the inspiration for this particular episode actually came from another YouTube video, specifically an episode of the great cooking show Binging with Babish, in which the host, Andrew Ray, aka Oliver Babish, challenges his co host, Sola Alwaeli, to cook mac and cheese using only ingredients and tools that would have been available in the 18th century. It's a very fun video. Now, at the very beginning of the challenge, Sola, trying to be as authentic as possible, tries to light her fire using flint. And this is authentic. For hundreds of years, people would have carried around what's known as a tinderbox, which would have contained a piece of flint, a steel to strike it on, and then some form of tinder, either uh, dried fungus or lichen, or maybe a charred bit of linen, anything that would readily catch fire when it was hit by sparks. But right out of the gate, she runs into trouble as she tries to bang together two large pieces of flint. And eventually she gives up and trying to stay true to the challenge while still cheating somewhat, decides to light the fire using a pre-lit candle. Now, to be fair to Sola, her inability to light that fire has nothing to do with proper technique or lack of persistence or anything like that. Banging two pieces of flint like that together, she never would have been able to light a fire because contrary to popular belief, it's not the flint that produces the spark, it's actually the steel. Flint is quite a bit harder than iron or mild steel, and when you strike it against steel, you're actually gonna shave off tiny little particles of steel which as soon as they hit the air are going to exhibit a property known as pyrophoricity. Now, a pyrophoric substance is one that spontaneously reacts with oxygen in the air and ignites. Now, most metals are actually pyrophoric. The problem is, is that in the bulk forms in which we use them, there's so much thermal mass there that any sort of heat generated by the reaction between the metal and the oxygen in the air is going to be quickly wicked away and absorbed by the bulk of that metal. However, if you take that metal and you grind it up into very, very fine particles, those particles will readily react with the oxygen in the air, they'll heat up very quickly, and they will ignite. Now, a lot of different substances are pyrophoric, some far more than steel and other metals. And a good example of this is something called triethyl aluminum. Uh, this is an organometallic compound. It's a clear liquid that, when exposed to the air, violently bursts into flames and burns at an extremely high temperature. It's so pyrophoric, in fact, it's one of the few substances that will ignite spontaneously on contact with cryogenic liquid oxygen. And for this reason, it's often used as an igniter in rocket engines. Uh, for example, uh, the Falcon 9 rocket that SpaceX produces uses triethyl aluminum as an igniter, and if you've ever watched footage of an old space shuttle launch, you may have noticed when the main engine is light, there's these weird sparks that fly from the pad across the flame of the engines. And what that is, it's a sprayer that's actually spraying triethyl aluminum beneath the engine to burn off any excess hydrogen from the fuel tanks so that it doesn't accumulate underneath the pad, ignite, and damage the spacecraft. Triethyl aluminum is also used in many military applications. Uh, one of the most common usages is in decoy flares. Now, military aircraft will generally carry two types of countermeasures against anti-aircraft missiles. One is chaff, which is little strips of metal foil that produce a large radar signature to confuse radar-guided missiles. And the other are flares, which are hot pyrotechnics that are launched out to confuse heat-seeking missiles such as the Sidewinder. And since you want these to be very reliable, you don't want to have a complicated ignition mechanism, a lot of flares consist mainly of a little sealed canister or triethyl aluminum, and when it's ejected from the aircraft, that seal is broken, and as soon as it hits the air, it spontaneously ignites and produces a very large heat signature that hopefully will deflect a missile. Triethyl aluminum is also used as an incendiary compound for lighting fires, um, most famously in something called the M202, which is a quad-barreled rocket launcher that was developed around the Vietnam War to replace uh, World War II-era flamethrowers, which they thought were a bit too bulky and unwieldy and dangerous to the operator. And you're probably actually familiar with the M202 because it was prominently featured in the 1985 uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Commando. Now, another extremely pyrophoric substance that's seen a significant amount of use in aviation and military applications 
is something called diborane. And most famously, this was used to ignite the engines in the Lockheed A-12 and SR-71 Blackbird spy planes. And the reason why this substance was needed to light the engine is actually quite interesting. When the Blackbird flew at Mach 3, it experienced quite a bit of frictional heating. And because of this, the plates that made up its skin couldn't actually be fitted close together because as they expanded in the heat, if they were fitted, butted one up against each other, they would buckle. So they're actually built with pre-engineered gaps between them. But since the structure of the wing was where you actually kept the fuel, when this thing was fueled up on the ground, it leaked like a sieve. And to stop accidents from happening, to stop this fuel leaking on the tarmac from spontaneously igniting, they used a fuel that was extremely difficult to ignite. So they couldn't use traditional spark igniters, and they had to use a tank of diborane that they would inject into the engines to light the fuel. And indeed, the standard operating procedure for the SR-71 and the A-12 before it was that you would load just enough fuel to get the aircraft off the ground. It would take off, do a high-speed run to warm up uh, its fuselage so that all the plates would expand and seal up. And it would go up to an in-flight refueling tanker, take on a full load of fuel, and then go off on its mission. Anyway, coming back full circle, a less exotic pyrophoric material that you've definitely come into contact with is something called ferrocerium, which, as the name implies, is a combination of iron and cerium. And this is a softish uh, ceramic-like compound that can be pressed into tiny little pellets, which we use as lighter flints or as survival flints. This rod right here is a big old chunk of ferrocerium. And unlike in a traditional flint and steel, I'm not producing sparks on the steel. Instead, I'm shaving off pieces of ferrocerium, which are quite a bit more pyrophoric, and they burn a lot hotter than particles of iron. And here we have it integrated with uh, two nice little nylon handles, and then we even have a little compartment in the back here that holds a piece of synthetic tinder. So quite a little handy little device. Anyway, I thought it would clear up that common misconception about how a flint and steel actually works. And hopefully that will be useful to you next time you get lost in the woods and need to start a fire. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet another fascinating artifact just like this one. I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.